New developments tonight in the wake of a deadly school shooting in Georgia. Why the father of the 14 year old suspect has been arrested. A man murdered a two year old 40 years ago and now he could be released from prison. The reason why and how the victim's family feels. We're starting to push the smoke away, but we're bringing the heat. How hot will temperatures get looking towards the weekend? I'll let you know. It's a great asset for people around here to come to. The first ever ER in Syracuse city limits is now open and residents are already taking advantage of it. Tackling student lunch debt. We'll hear from Governor Spencer Cox why he decided to allocate more than a million dollars in relief funds to help families in need. It's an interview that you'll only see here. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Chapman. We are tracking two big stories on the local and national fronts tonight. We start with new developments happening in Georgia after yesterday's mass shooting at Appalachia High School. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation have arrested 50 year old Colin Gray. He's the father of the 14 year old suspect Colt Gray. He is charged with the following. Four counts of involuntary manslaughter two counts of second degree murder and eight counts of cruelty to children. Mr. Gray, these charges stem from Mr. Gray knowingly allowing his son Colt to possess a weapon. Here are the latest details about the shooting investigation. Authorities say Colt Gray, the 14 year old suspect, used an AR style rifle to kill math teachers Christina Arimi and Richard Aspinwall, along with students Christian Angulo and Mason Schimmerhorn. He apparently left an algebra class yesterday and then returned with a gun, but was not allowed back in, so he started firing. The nine others who were injured are expected to survive. We're also learning the shooter was interviewed by the FBI last year over online threats, but denied writing the posts. Colt Gray has been charged as an adult and will make his first court appearance tomorrow. Back here in Utah, it has now been two days since that horrific tragedy in West Haven, where a 32 year old woman and three children all under the age of five were found shot dead in a car outside a home. Fox 13 News spoke with a woman's brother named Christian off camera. He says their family does not know how this happened. He said she was a caring and genuine mother and her kids were her life. He also said she left the house Sunday night with the children. Two days later, another family member found their bodies on Tuesday night. Fox 13 News also spoke with other people in the neighborhood today. They told us they never saw this coming. It's just something that don't normally happen, stuff like that. You hear about it on TV and stuff like that, but in your neighborhood where you live like this, it's shock more than anything else because we had no idea. This is a pretty quiet neighborhood. The Weber County Sheriff's Office will hold a news conference tomorrow morning at 1130 to provide more information on the investigation. Fox 13 News will be there to provide that update live during our midday newscasts. The St. George man who allegedly killed his wife last weekend has now officially been charged with murder. Court documents indicate 47 year old Nikki Sampson was found dead Sunday night with bruises all over her body. Police found her journal near her body where she wrote that she wanted to escape from her husband, 50 year old Eric Sampson, adding she was afraid for her life. Eric Sampson was drinking the day she died. He told authorities he did not call 911, but acknowledged that he should have. Eric Sampson is scheduled to face a judge tomorrow. Back in 1980, a Clinton teenager murdered a two year old girl. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenser explains why now it's been recommended he get out of prison. The first thing I honestly remember is my dad running to me in the yard and saying I can't find Annie. Four decades ago, the teenager who lived down the street from Janice Hoskins and Gara kidnapped her two year old sister, Annie, and strangled her. She's in my living room. <laughs> but this is her. Now, after all this time, her sister's killer, John P. Miller Jr., could get out of prison under a compassionate release. I had a lot of survivor's remorse. 
because it was like, oh, you're you're the older sister. The recommendation came from Correctional Health Services. Division Director Mark Wisner says they only give the medical opinion under a set standard. It's then up to the parole board to decide. We are just one piece of a compassionate release. That's it, one piece. There's many other things that go into it. Risk assessment, um, you know, uh, the crimes, all sorts of things that go into it. Miller's attorney tells Fox 13 News that the 60 year old suffered a stroke this year and is partially paralyzed. He can't speak and can't understand speech. This is a serious medical concern and the capacity to handle this concern here in the prison does not exist or not for a long term period. Wisner says Miller's case is part of a bigger problem of a growing number of sick inmates and a lack of facility resources to react. What are we going to do if they cannot be released? Are we going to grow capacity within the prison? And if so, who funds that? And who, who, who works that? Annie's sister says her family's feelings are complicated, but overall, they're choosing compassion. Let him have the comforts he needs for his final days, as long as everyone is safe. It feels so much better to forgive, you know? Um, it just, it feels like that's the best way to honor my little sister. Miller's attorney tells me that she's still researching and hasn't decided on what her recommendation to the parole board will be, whether he'll get the best care here or somewhere else. Reporting in front of the state prison, Emily Tensor, Fox 13 News, Utah. Cool thing about Utah is we do step up and I got a grateful to, to you and, and your team there who've helped shine a light on this issue. Tackling student lunch debt. Tuesday, Governor Spencer Cox announced he was redirecting more than a million dollars in unused COVID-19 relief funds to pay delinquent balances for families most in need. Fox 13 News anchor John Franke has been tracking this issue over the last two years. He spoke with Governor Cox in an exclusive interview. Back in 2023, my reporting found nearly $2 million of unpaid school lunch debt right here in Utah. And in April of this year, that number had ballooned to roughly 2.8 million. Clearly, the problem isn't going away. And that's one reason why Governor Spencer Cox decided to find a way to use nearly $1.2 million in COVID relief funds to help families facing the most need. This is one of those rare occasions where I, I kind of did get to wave a magic wand. Faced with $1.2 million of federal funds that were set to be returned to Washington, D.C., Governor Spencer Cox believes he found the best way to keep that money right here in Utah. It would have been spent somewhere else if, if you know, it's, it's one thing, too, if, they, if this money would be returned to taxpayers, but that's certainly not the way it works in Washington, D.C., <laughs> and uh, better that we spend it here in Utah than get spent in some other state. These funds from the American Rescue Plan will now be redirected to the governor's emergency education relief program. The plan will allow local education agencies to apply for reimbursement of school lunch debt held by families who qualify for reduced price lunch. The governor believes this type of relief needs to be targeted to those most in need. We have limited resources and limited funds, so trying to find the right balance really matters. But uh, we, we want to help. In, you know, my experience, these are, these are working class families. These, these are families that are doing their best. And while this is a temporary fix, the governor left the door open to working with the legislature on finding a long term solution. We're trying to understand, you know, why the debt is there, who needs it, um, what's happening, and how we can uh, how we can be helpful. I, I don't want any kid to go hungry. And it's, it's never a child's fault. We want to be clear, this is just a one-time allocation of funding to give those who are struggling a fresh start. Families are still expected to pay their bills here in this school year. On Utah's Capitol Hill, John Franke, Fox 13 News, Utah. We just can't get a break from the smoke. Another day, Breck, where it's so visible all across the state. I know we've been spreading the smoke throughout the state, so the allocation, yeah, it is going statewide. Less concentration, though, here across northern Utah, so that is kind of a silver lining. As we show you a view from our Natural History Museum, this is actually a time lapse through the day where, you know, sometimes it's the sun angle kind of making an impact visibly. Do we see more smoke? But truly, it has been thinning out here across northern Utah. We haven't seen some improvement. 
improvements. As we look at our air view, looking at these air quality sensors powered by TELUS, we look at the color schemes there where we're seeing more green and yellow. That's in between moderate or even good. There as we look in Box Elder and Cache County. Weber County also seeing good conditions. We start to see yellow with a little hint of orange still, but even some green here through the Salt Lake Valley. So it's really further south you go. We're seeing a little bit more concentration of smoke and thus diminishing air quality so through central, west central and southwestern Utah. We're actually looking at some of the poorer air quality, uh, quality I should say, at least at this point. Temperatures here for today, looking at afternoon highs. We got up into the upper 80s, Ogden through Salt Lake City. We topped off at 84 in Provo. So a little warmer here across northern Utah, but a little cooler towards southern Utah, at least down through City City over towards areas such as Moab. St. George, though, you didn't get much of a cool down from that front that hit as you're still holding on to the 90s at this hour. Right now, though, here along the Wasatch Front, we're in the 70s, even 60s, currently in Logan. We show you the satellite radar, nothing to be highlighting, no clouds, no rain. We're going to keep it clear here in the overnight hours. Still holding on to the smoke, so we'll see a little smoke here throughout the Wasatch Front through northern Utah, but again, we're seeing that smoke spread across most of the state, especially on the west side, but overnight lows getting down into the low 60s. This is this smoke really going to be moving away as we go towards the weekend? And do we see any chance of rain over the next few days? We'll talk about that coming up in just a few minutes. It's a project two years in the making. How this new emergency room is filling a big need in the community. Plus, a bill signed into law earlier this year aims to support starter home development. We'll take a look at the progress made so far. And meet the Utah Hockey Club's new broadcast team. The city of Syracuse, Utah is growing, but one thing its residents have not had is an emergency room close to home. That is until now. The nearest main hospital to that town are in Layton, Bountiful and Ogden. You can see on this map today, though, there's an ER in Syracuse city limits. Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold takes us to the community unveiling of the facility. Yeah, I was on the please. back of this electric scooter with my 12 year old son on the front. A fun Monday night ride on this scooter changed quickly for Ashley Alder. We went off of the curb and crashed. Her son I wasn't was, hurt, but I, Alder's I, shoulder took the brunt of the fall. The next day I went to work and the shoulder just got worse and worse. After going to a couple of urgent cares that she says didn't take her insurance. I remembered the new ER in Syracuse that just opened up and stopped in there and they got me right in, right in for x-rays. On Thursday, the ribbon was officially cut on Mountain Star Healthcare's new Syracuse Emergency Center. The freestanding ER is a department of Ogden Regional Medical Center. It's complete with 11 patient exam rooms, 24-7 emergency medical care, as well as lab and imaging services. Acute injuries, trauma, um, you know, heart conditions like heart attacks or heart arrhythmias, strokes, you know, things that need where time is of the essence for care, it's very important to have that access. Former City Councilwoman Lisa Bingham says it's a project that is two years in the making. Bingham says with substantial growth in the city. We're up to about 32, 35,000, and we're expected to see up to 50 to 60,000 when we're at build out. Comes a significant need. Our response time was for the east side of the city, about seven minutes from the um, from our fire station, and that's too long. And now with this facility, that can cut it down, depending on where we're at, from probably two to five minutes. Something Syracuse Fire Battalion Chief Corey Bybee yep. says yep. is crucial in a life-saving scenario. Minutes count, sometimes so seconds count. For Alder, her injury wasn't like, severe this it, time. It is nice to have one an ER that's close by that can give you peace of mind. Several city leaders and residents I spoke to on Thursday say they would love to see this facility grow into a full service hospital in the future. Here in Syracuse, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. If you've been outside the last two days in Salt Lake, you've realized our air quality is certainly not the greatest right now. So what is exactly causing our air quality to be like this and how you can protect yourself and your family? The wildfire smoke being blown in from California and Idaho is causing our bad air quality. And right now that PM 2.5 particulate is really what's causing all of the haze you see. 
Fox 13 News spoke with Dr. Carrie Kelly, an expert on this topic from the University of Utah about how that PM 2.5 particulate can affect your short term as well as your long term. They can include short term effects like um, bringing on asthma, exacerbating asthma, coughing, sneezing, eye irritation um, to more serious long term effects like uh, heart attacks, strokes, loss of cognitive function, loss of IQ points. So you want to mitigate your exposure to those fine particles. Well, the biggest and best thing you can do to protect yourself from bad air is stay indoors. Most of our homes have pretty good filtration systems, and that particulate does not make its way inside nearly as much as outside. Now, if you do have to go outside, make sure to avoid strenuous activities because breathing in more of this air is going to mean more of that particulate getting inside your lungs and can cause some pretty serious problems. So we just have to know, Breck, when can we not worry about bad air? When are we going to get a cleaning of Utah's air? Well, we are seeing some improvements in comparison over the past 24 hours. It's still around, though, and as we've been talking about, it's been moving further south towards the west, spreading throughout most of the state, even down through St. George, where we've been looking at air quality concerns between moderate yellow to unhealthy orange, even as we track through central and southern Utah. But as I mentioned, we are seeing, again, those improvements here across northern Utah. Utah, actually extreme northern Utah, moving through Weber County, currently in the green. Now, Davis Salt Lake County, where earlier on you were in the orange, now in the yellow, at least right here across northern Utah, the only county that's still in that unhealthy category for sensitive groups there in orange, it's Utah County. Now, in St. George, current uh, air quality in the yellow, moderate concern level, you're still holding on to the 90s. Winds out of the northeast at seven mile, 17 miles per hour. It's that northeasterly flow that has allowed the smoke to spread again a little bit further south and towards the west it's thinning out we'll start to see some small improvements for tomorrow and then through the weekend i do have a question mark though the middle of next week we have a cool front that's going to be making its move through that changes the wind direction back to the northwest if the wildfires continue to burn through idaho we could see a new supply of smoke again in the middle of next week so salt lake city right now though we're in the mid 70s winds of the north at seven miles per hour we got a high today of 87 degrees above average you can see the record as we've been showing you all throughout the week set back in 2022 at 104 degrees yes we can even see triple digits here in the first week of September and you we're getting past the point where that's just not a concern and it's not a concern here in the forecast looking ahead what is a concern is the smoke now smoke forecast where the smoke's going to be moving you can see still uh, still see it thinning out but it's in place across northern central west central Utah a little thicker but we're not seeing the green or the yellow or even some red which we saw of course yesterday in place into through this morning so we are going to see those improvements here each and every day we'll kind of keep it in that moderate concern level though at least leading up to the weekend. But speaking of leading up into the weekend, we do bring a chance of some rain showers for St. George. This will help out with the smoke just a bit. There's about a 30% chance of maybe seeing some scattered rain showers and some thunderstorms across southern Utah. Now for northern Utah, it's also Sunday that as well that we see a threat of an isolated shower spilling over into Tuesday, Wednesday as well. Not a big threat, even with the cool front, we don't see uh, wide, widely scattered th uh, showers or you know persistent rain. But it's definitely going to be a better possibility than what we've been seeing here over the past couple of days. Now, as we look wide view here, we're seeing that high pressure building and that's what's going to be bringing the heat. So we're going to be talking about some hot temperatures. So we get the smoke sticking around and we're bringing the heat as well. But it looks to be dry at least through tomorrow into Saturday as well. Now, as we take a look at your temperatures here in the overnight hours, getting down into the 60s here, Ogden down through Provo, 50s in Logan, upper 40s in Evanston. As you're seeing the smoke little lines there, that'll be in place again, mainly across northern through western, central and southwestern Utah. Now for tomorrow, it's warmer back in the 90s. Ogden through Salt Lake, upper 80s in Logan. We'll be looking at temperatures through central Utah in the range from mid to upper 80s, even low 90s in Cedar City. Again, still the smoke around across western Utah here along the Wasatch Front, but we will be breathing a little bit easier, even in St. George, where you've got triple digit temperatures. You've got the sunshine up until Sunday, as mentioned, 30% chance of seeing a rain shower or an isolated thunderstorm. Then it's 90s, barely, as you can see, upper 90s, and then triple digits on Wednesday, so a little bit of a cool down. Again, once we get past Sunday, we don't see much of a chance of rain thereafter. But for northern Utah, we hold on to a threat at least of an isolated shower Monday 
uh, Tuesday into Wednesday, question mark, maybe some mountain showers, but then with a cool front approach, we can see some rain and temperatures dropping down into the 80s. But for most days, we're going to keep it above average and low 90s for the weekend. We'll be back right after the break. In national news tonight, Hunter Biden has pleaded guilty in his federal tax case, avoiding a trial. Biden was facing felony charges over a scheme to not pay $1.4 million in federal taxes. The surprise guilty plea came the same day jury selection was set to begin in the case. The plea change also came after the judge rejected some experts the defense lined up to testify about addiction. President Joe Biden said he would not pardon or commute a sentence handed down against his son. When asked today whether the president has changed his mind, a White House press secretary said no. Sentencing is scheduled for December 16th. Former President Donald Trump laid out his economic plan this afternoon, just one day after his Democratic rival, Vice President Kamala Harris, detailed her policy proposals. Trump told business leaders he plans to slash regulations to boost energy production, drastically cut government spending, and decrease taxes for companies that produce goods in the U.S. from 21 percent down to 15 percent. Trump said Tesla CEO Elon Musk will head a commission to perform a financial audit of the U.S. government to slash trillions of dollars in spending. He also proposed an end to taxing tips and Social Security income. Trump's economic policy is a stark difference from the proposals laid out by Harris. Don't forget, you can watch next week's presidential debate between former President Trump and Vice President Harris right here on Fox 13. We will carry Fox News coverage of this debate on Tuesday, September 10th, beginning at 7 p.m. Starter homes in short supply, a housing market out of reach for countless Utahns. Kind of hits home with people that uh, that it's their kids that, that need these homes. And a new idea to build Utah out of the problem. How do we improve the lives of the people that are going to live in this community? You're the guy who came up with this. And we talk to the local developer who is actually making it happen right now. If I can help Utah stay in Utah, then I have a real purpose. The new approach to starter homes and how it could work coming up next. It has been 168 days since Governor Cox signed HB 572. The law is supposed to make it easier for first time home buyers to afford a house by assisting developers with state surplus money. Fox 13 News anchor Bob Evans has the story from Pleasant View. We've got uh, our first 572 project was just approved up in Weaver County. After hearing from local developer Jed Nielsen, the county commission said yes. The county commission approved an additional 275 units. There was an original um, development agreement for 725 units, so they got a 275 unit bonus. All of those will be single family detached homes for sale under $400,000. And they will be restricted for 10 years. Only the owners can live in them, and those who live and work in the community will get preferred buyer status. People live out here because they want the wide open spaces. At first, Weber County Commissioner Jim Harvey was against expanding the project. Everybody likes that bigger, nicer house, and they all aspire to be there, and I wanted to, to be there, but one night I had a dream. Harvey dreamed about how he grew up in a small two-bedroom, one-bath home with a dad who worked at Thiokol and neighbors whose parents were electricians, school teachers, and police officers. And in his dream, he asked the question, why don't we have these types of smaller homes anymore? The very next day, I had a meeting with this developer and he said, hey, listen, we'll make, these, we'll make all these homes homeowner occupied. And that was the ticket right there a homeowner occupied lot, detached home, and that was it. But here's the statistic that really turned Harvey. In 2022, the most recent data available, the median net worth of renters was $10,400. That's compared to the median net worth of homeowners being $396,000. 
$200. That's a difference of more than 3,700%, or 40 times more. Utah housing attainabilities are Steve Waldrop. And so we posed the question to the commissioners and said, how many chances do you get in your lifetime to create, literally with a stroke of a pen, $100 million of net worth, of value in, in homes, in families, in your community? You're, you're creating generational wealth in a way that is completely unique to any other opportunity you'll ever have. And that really hit home. We have an opportunity now for the next generation to create some wealth within the, their own household the, to buy their own home, not just to have to rent, but to buy a home between $330,000 and $380,000 for a detached home is not, it's nowhere else. And so we're really excited about that. You know, one of the major costs for developers, even before anybody starts swinging a hammer, is putting in the curb and gutter, the storm drains, and all the infrastructure needed to support the new homes. And if they can get a break on what it costs to do all of that and then pass that on to the new home buyers, then everybody wins. I love Utah and I love Utahns. And I, and I love people from Ogden. Jed Nilsson is a developer in Weber County who for the past five years has been on a mission to build starter homes that first time buyers can afford. Because owning a home is the, um, the, basically the number one way for people to gain wealth. So with the idea of helping Utahns to pass on generational wealth, Nilsson dug in with the governor's team and was the genesis of what became House Bill 572. It was Nilsson who was the tip of the spear on that legislation. And the subsequent hard work of Steve Waldrop, State Representative Robert Spendlove, and everyone else who caught the vision. If I can make a difference, while my company still makes money, like we're gonna to have to make money, right, to stay in business. But if I can make a difference and I can help Utahns stay in Utah, then I have a real purpose and, then, and my company has a real mission. And For developers to have access to the lower cost state surplus money to build infrastructure, they must agree that 60% of the homes built will be starter homes, less than 1,400 square feet and three to $400,000. There is no question developers make more profit on larger homes, but for Nilsson, it isn't about the money. You know, it may not be the best financial thing that I could do, but it's still a dream come true for me because I know that I'm going to be helping kind of my nieces and nephews, um, the children of our employees, uh, you know, our local firefighters and teachers and first responders. We're going to give them an opportunity to own a home and stay in Utah and not be in their parents' basement. Bob Evans, Fox 13 News, Utah. Construction in this development in Pleasant View, west of I-15, will begin in the next two months. Nielsen hopes this project will inspire other developers and counties all around the state to see that the governor's goal of 35,000 new starter homes in the next five years actually can be done. All right, now this month, September is Suicide Prevention Month. Up next, we'll take a look at how the 988 crisis line works two years after its launch. And it may not be John Williams or Hans Zimmer, but the city of St. George now has a soundtrack. We'll share some of it with you when we come back. This Sunday is 988 Day to mark the beginning of National Suicide Prevention Week. It's something that hits home since, according to the CDC, Utah has more cities than any other state with a high prevalence of depression. Three cities rank in the top 20. Ogden comes in at number 12, while Salt Lake and Logan tie at number 20. But Utah has made strides. The Beehive State was the first in the nation to transition to a three digit number for people to call when they're in a mental health crisis. Launching two years ago now on a national basis, the campaign to raise awareness about the 988 number is in part about clearing up the confusion between 911 and 988. It's not like 911. They are trained to answer and quickly deploy resources. 
our 988 team is actually trained to answer the call and then work to de-escalate the crisis, assess for the level of safety or risk that someone's experiencing, and then make the appropriate connection to resources. And those resources can include deploying a mobile crisis outreach team to someone contemplating suicide or getting them to one of the state's crisis receiving centers. A composer has created a soundtrack for downtown St. George and it fits in the palm of your hand. Listen to this. Are you getting St. George vibes off of that music? It's pretty relaxing. And that's just a small selection of the soundtrack in the SG Music Walk app. Glenn Webb, a per percussion professor at Utah Tech University, he's been working with the city of St. George on this project for nearly a year and a half. The SG Music Walk app uses GPS positioning to take users through different instrumental selections depending on where they are. Not a boombox experience exactly. It's it's supposed to be more uh, personal, more intimate, reflecting on the music, or I hope the music uh, leads the, the listener, the walker, to reflect on some different things and relax. And so it's a, it's a little bit of music therapy. Yeah, what a great idea. Webb hopes to expand the soundtrack beyond downtown St. George to the rest of the city. Hey, we have to thank you. Your generosity made a big difference with our Give a Child a Book Blitz, which took place yesterday. Each donation was matched by the Scripps Howard Fund. In total, this is impressive. We raised more than $17,000. That's a lot of books. And you can still donate. In fact, you can do so the rest of the month. All you have to do is scan that QR code on your screen to go to our website, or you can text Fox 13 Reads, all one word, to 501 Five, five. All of the money we raise together stays right here in Utah. So Utah children at Utah schools will be able to pick out their own books. So thank you again so much for all your help and generosity and perhaps changing the life of a child. Breck. Progress. Our monthly goal is thirty thousand dollars, so we're trying to get there. Hey, weather-wise, our goal is to get rid of the smoke. We know it's going to be thinning out, pushing away. Do we steer clear of the smoke heading into the weekend? I'll answer that after the break. And later in sports, part of my conversation with the new Utah Hockey Club broadcasting team as the NHL preseason nears really close. Plus, big night for local volleyball with both the Utes and the Cougars in play. Back in a bit. Well, today, a bat mitigation company is working to clear Juab High School of you-know-what bats. They were discovered in the rafters of the gym Tuesday. According to Dr. Cody Hughes, the Juab School District Superintendent, they closed access to the gym after they found at least 10 bats in the area. Today, the mitigation company removed the bats. They also sealed off the areas. They feel like the bats are getting in. The district tells us classes on that side of the building have since been moved and so far no students or staff have come in contact with any of the bats. Health officials are warning about some bad conditions at Pineview and Deer Creek Reservoirs. The Weber Morgan Health Department says a harmful algal bloom at Pineview has expanded and now all areas of the lake are impacted. Meanwhile, Utah's Department of Environmental Quality has issued a danger advisory for the Charleston day use area at Deer Creek Reservoir. But people in northern Utah were not the only ones with hazy skies today. Check this out. Southern Utah got hit pretty hard. This is what it looked like in St. George today. Kind of difficult to see that pretty red rock of mm -hmm. southern Utah with all the haze. It's kind of a better picture, I suppose. As the day went on, I guess we did get a little Some bit Some improvements, but it was thick down there. You know, uh, I was looking at the air quality all across the state. Sometimes yeah. we just focus here across northern Utah. And we got the impact. whole state. We have the whole state <laughs> here, and the smoke has been moving through the whole state. Improvements, yes, but we were in the orange. I mean, is it moving out? Is it moving the it's right mo direction? It was moving south and starting to move west, so it is thinning out. We've been seeing some improvements here across northern Utah. 
towards southern Utah, you get those improvements for tomorrow. So we're heading in the right direction now. We don't completely clear things out. Possibility maybe by Sunday and Monday as we change the flow out of the southwest, that'll start pushing that smoke away. But here's the thing, we might see it returning by the middle of next week with a cool front approaching. We're going to see more of a northwest flow that brings the flow in from Idaho once again. Outside right now, though, as we take a look at your current temperatures, we're looking at the air quality in Salt Lake County. We're in the yellow, moderate concern. Yesterday, we we're in the red, so this is good news. We're breathing a little bit easier. Temperatures currently in the 70s. Looking at your air quality forecast, we're overall across the Wasatch Front. Again, we're in the yellow, moderate concern, but there are some areas extreme northern Utah. You're in the green. We'll kind of stay through the yellow up through Sunday and Monday, getting close to green. Monday through Tuesday, but you'll see kind of makes a direction change there heading upwards on Wednesday. That's a question mark because, of course, we have to be looking at if the wildfires still are producing a lot of smoke that might push through here as we look towards the middle of next week with that approaching cool front. All right, let's reflect back over the past seven days. Last Thursday in the 80s into the 90s, close to triple digits on Sunday. Of course, we had a nice little bit of a cool down with that front approaching. We're heading back into the 90s, low 90s here due to the high pressure that is going to be building in. It's not really strong, so we're not looking at triple digit temperatures. Don't see that in the forecast here for the rest of the year, really. It's going to be hot, though, especially across southern Utah, temperatures in the triple digits. Then we see this little dip in the jet stream, but before that, high pressure moves a little bit further eastward. We start to to drag in some moisture here across southern Utah, spreading it across the state. So it gives us a chance of maybe seeing a few isolated showers or even some scattered rain showers and some thunderstorms initially on Sunday for southern Utah and then pushing further northward Monday into Tuesday. So as we take a look at the rain forecast here, looking at the computer models, moving the clock Thursday and Friday, you see nothing. Friday to Saturday, also not seeing much. Late Saturday into Sunday, we start to see things lining up through Nevada. Pushing through Sunday, though, we start to at least introduce a chance here across western, southwestern Utah here, moving through the second half of the weekend. So again, under that southerly flow, though, that will push smoke away. It might push it actually back towards northern Utah for a brief period of time before it exits the state. Uh, temperatures, though, here in the overnight hours, again, 50s and 60s tomorrow. It's back into the 90s, Ogden through Salt Lake City, close to 90 degrees in Delta. Yes, I still show that smoke. It's definitely going to be thin, but it's again not completely clearing out. So we'll keep our eye on the air quality for tomorrow as well. Upper 80s, as you can see, with the forecast high in Richville, 93 in Moab, 85 in Vernal. We have low 80s in Blinding. Now for St. George, it's triple digits. Sunny, some smoke still around. Improvements though. Sunday though, you can see a 30% chance under partly cloudy skies. Maybe seeing some scattered rain showers or an isolated thunderstorm. Should kind of uh, push that moisture away, at least push it further northward, where again for northern Utah, we see the isolated threat Sunday through Monday. Could spill over into Tuesday as well. All in all, though, you can see those temperatures staying in the 90s until that next cool front hits by next week, Wednesday into Thursday. That'll drop us back to where we should be for this time of year, also bringing us a chance of some rain showers. So again, looking to bring that summer heat here for the weekend. Never before has a team three-peated in the National Football League, but after hoisting up the Lombardi Trophy, two years running, former BYU lineman Andy Reid and the Chiefs will chase history. The brand new NFL slate underway tonight in Kansas City. The uh, Chiefs got their Super Bowl rings at Arrowhead Stadium. Lamar Jackson had a second half touchdown pass, then Patrick Mahomes followed up with a touchdown pass. The Chiefs currently have 27-20, but the Ravens have the ball at the 10 with about I don't know, five, ten seconds left, something like that. So they are marching. The 3-0 Uinta Utes on the Wasatch Front to visit Spanish Fork tonight. McKay Smith, I like the thread for the Dons. Brock Jacobson's second touchdown catch. He had three altogether. Uinta on the board right here. Dace Obagi to cut the 14-0 lead in half. But Spanish responded with three more scores come the second quarter, including a designed hook and ladder back to Caden Vest. This was all Don's 56 to 26. 17 days out from preseason hockey and just over a month away from the season debut. The Utah Hockey Club has their broadcast team in place. Matt McConnell has been calling play by play in the National Hockey League for nearly three decades now, including 13 with the Coyotes, while Dominic Moore brings in the color following 16 seasons as a player in the NHL. The pair join me in studio today, ready to break ice on this new era. Colin hockey has its own rhythm, its own beat. It seems like have you guys been able to kind of rehearse a little bit and practice, get the chemistry down? 
Well, I, we, we talked, believe it or not, we talked for the first time just a couple of days ago. <laughs> there you but, go. But, it, you know, things like that, and that's a great question. So you're practicing right now. A, a little bit, you know. I'm, I'm waiting to see if he's going to buy my dinner tonight, you know, and we can, you know, go talk. And I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, of course. But I, 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 think it, I think that, you know, if you've done it for a while, that comes pretty naturally. And Dom has done it here for a while. And, um, you know, certainly I've worked with a lot of good people in the past as well. So um, I think the chemistry will come pretty quick. I, I really do and you know preseason's what two weeks away so we're gonna find out in a hurry here fun conversation volleyball last season Utah and Cal were both in the Pac-12 the Utes now the Big 12 and the Bears onto the ACC Camry Bailey lays one down the Utes up in set two short set this time going to Allie Olsen Utah taking the first couple of sets at home followed by the last one for the sweep give Ryan Voss credit for the block that time. The 4-0 Utes will next host number eight Purdue tomorrow night. While 14th ranked BYU in play at their own Nike Invitational. Blue though coughing up round two here. Courtney Jones was standout for Lipscomb tonight out of the Atlantic Sun Conference. Evens up the match at one, but the Lady Cougs held strong from there. Kirstie Strong looking strong with the kill and match point eerily similar. Strong again to put it away, BYU. Will next host Georgia Tech next. Of course, football, BYU is on the road at SMU tomorrow night. Okay. And then the big one on Saturday, the Utes host Baylor. Wow, some big games ahead. Not just in football, but uh, volleyball all and the all the other yeah. fall sports. Yeah, it's a fun time. All right, thanks, Morgan. Yeah. We'll be right back. Come on, who doesn't love a little friendly competition, right, guys? <laughs> Park City Correct, is yes. planning to take on Breckenridge, Colorado by breaking a world record for this, the longest shot ski. The two cities have tossed the title back and forth for the past eight years, and it's time for Park City to take back the crown. <laughs> Found out early on that if we try to beat them by 200 shots, that means we need maybe 50 more skis that have three shots each. So we only are doing seven more than Breckenridge did. They did 1,377 um, December 2023. They've got it down. The hmm. calculations. <laughs> Breck, you can make up at least 20 of those 50, right? <laughs> That's it. I thought it had to be an individual <laughs> per shot, not just one know. person taking <laughs> seven to 20 more shots. Go find out. The uh, event will take place on the 12th at No one will outdrink us. <laughs> two o'clock on Main Street. If you'd like to join, you can sign up at parkcityshotski.com. Go get them, Park Come on, City. we right. got to get that title back. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. It makes it fun. Who gets to go on assignment to get keep that it safe. footage? We'll keep you updated. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Quick Cast is next.